Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 35. My name's Andy. Uh, we're continuing our conversation about async in Rust. This time, we're going to do one of the kind of fundamental building blocks of async. So this stuff is going to be things that you don't normally do in your day-to-day -day async programming. But if you can get your head around how this stuff works, your normal day-to-day -day async programming will be much easier to understand. Um, so it's going to be the future trait um, and what that really means. So let us create a very simple trait, which is a bit like a future. So we're calling this trait very simple future. It has um, uh, an associated type, which is output. And then it has one method. So things that implement this trait need to implement one method. That method is called poll, takes an immutable reference to self, and it returns a thing called a poll um, uh, with a generic type of the output. Like, so basically, this is a method that you call on a future to say, like, are you done or not? So poll means like, are you done or not? And the poll, uh, enum represents the, um, the two possible situations. Either, yes, I am done. I'm ready. And here's the thing that I was calculating, the T, um, which is self colon colon output in a, in our trait. Um, or no, I'm not ready. So I'm still pending. So that's the kind of fundamental structure of the future trait. Now, this isn't what the actual future trait looks like, but it looks a bit like this, right? Um, so we're going to use this simple thing to kind of expand our understanding of how futures work. Um, so bear in mind, by the way, that when you're writing your async code, you won't be writing the poll method. Um, now, if you if you speak to grizzled Rust programmers who were doing this stuff before the async and await keywords came along, they were writing the poll method. Um, but these days you won't need to. This is all going to be done for you underneath. But understanding how it works is going to help you understand um, what what happens with your code and why certain things work and certain things don't. So we're going to get into it. So let's make a struct that implements the very simple future trait. So this struct is called very simple alarm. And it holds on to like what time the alarm should go off. And its output is actually the unit type bracket bracket. So that's here. So, um, it doesn't, it doesn't provide any output. It just kind of says it's ready. Um, so the poll the implementation of the poll method is pretty straightforward. Basically it takes an immutable reference to self. It returns a poll of our output type, which is the unit. And then it says, if the time has got to after the alarm time, then we're ready as in the future is finished processing, otherwise we're still pending, right? So pretty straightforward. Um, so you can see that like futures themselves don't have any kind of magic in them. They're just like checking whether you're done or not. And if you're done, give me back the answer. Um, the question is, how would we actually run this code to get to, to get an alarm to go off? So here's an example of how we would do that without using any of the async await stuff in Rust, right? Just a really dumb way. So we create two alarms. We create an alarm which is set for three seconds from now, uh, and another alarm which is set for five seconds from now. And then we have an infinite loop. And we just ask each um, alarm, are you ready? So we say, if if the first alarm returns a ready, then we print out beep, beep, beep. And if the snooze alarm returns a ready, we print out you're late for work, and otherwise we do nothing. So if, poll, if we get back poll pending, we do nothing. Um, Otherwise, we we print those things. So this is going to be like tight looping. Um, no one else is going to be able to do any work when we do this, so this isn't really async or anything like that. But it's just an example of how you could use a future, how a future could work. Uh, and this is how it, it goes. Like it prints beep, beep, beep many, 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 many times. And then after a while, it starts printing your late for work as well as beep, beep, beep. Um, and it, well, initially, for the first three seconds, it prints nothing, right? Because it's just tight looping around here over and over and over again. So, like our future type kind of works, um, but you know we're doing this tight looping thing. It, it seems pretty terrible. Okay, um, so yeah, as it, as I was saying, it's busy waiting. So what we actually want to do with the, our async code is instead of looping like that, we want to be able to be told when we're ready. And actually, in in practice, in Rust, it's actually want to be told when we might be ready. <laughs> so an example of that would be, um, you've, you've, you've got some kind of, um, future which is waiting for 
some stuff to come to you over the network, some internet request to complete or something like that, or some more data to come through. Um, so we ask the operating system to wake us up when we're, um, when some stuff has happened on the network, which might or might not, I guess, be um, the stuff that we're interested in. But yeah, so we basically say, put me to sleep um, and wake me up when something that is of interest to me has happened. So how are we going to implement that? Um, essentially, we need a way of getting our runtime, our executor thing, so that's like Tokyo or whatever, to kind of be able to register something to say, say to the operating system, wake me up when... Something, when something interesting has happened, and then the executor or the runtime will then poll us only when, like it thinks there might be something interesting to us happening. So let's just restructure our future trait a little bit, so that, or rather our implementation rather, um, so that it works a little bit more like that. So again, we've got, um, uh, yeah, no, it's, we've impl- slightly changed the, the future trait as well. So this is called a simple future instead of very simple future. It still has this output type, and but the poll function is slightly changed. Instead of just taking in uh, immutable reference to self, it now takes in an immutable reference to self. I'm not sure why. And it also takes in a waker function, um, which we'll see used in a minute. So, um, like, you've got, you may be asking, like, who passes this in? The person calling poll... Um, before didn't really know how to provide this thing. So we'll think about that in a second. But anyway, um, poll method now takes in not just a uh, reference to self, but also this, this thing, which is a, a function, doesn't return anything, doesn't take any arguments, but it's like a, a kind of waker. And we'll see how it's used in a second. And then we've got this struct called socket read, which is just another imp- thing that implements future. Um, we're implementing future here and we're saying, uh, when we read from a socket, we're going to get back um, some bytes, so a vector of u8, um, and then our poll. Here's our implementation of our poll function. It takes in this waker. We're not we're not providing the waker here, uh, and then we're going to do different things based on whether we're kind of ready. So what we do is we ask the operating system, "Are you ready?" And if so, we say, "Yep, we're ready." And then like read some stuff out of out of there. So this is very similar to our previous example, just a more complicated because it's doing stuff with system calls and sockets, blah, blah, blah. Um, but essentially it says, have I, am I ready? If so, send back some data. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not ready. And then in the not ready cases, the more interesting thing, instead of just returning poll pending to say I'm not ready, we, we, say, we say to the operating system, please wake up, or rather please call this function. We don't know what this function is yet, but please call this function when there's some useful information. And the point is, from the point of view of someone who's implementing poll, we don't have to care about what this wake function is. It's provided by the runtime to say, um, uh, basically call this when something interesting might happen. And we, when in the case of a socket, we know how to say when something interesting happens. It's basically when this socket is readable, right? Which means like when some data has come in over this socket. So, as the implementer of poll, we've been given this thing, and all we do is pass it off to someone else that we know is going to um, wake up the runtime when something interesting might have happened, and that runtime will then call poll again on us. And we do check once poll gets called, poll, poll, poll gets called again. Um, we do check whether actually there is anything, any data to read. So we're kind of double checking there, like essentially, like I was saying, it's this thing of like something interesting might have happened, and we we kind of double check ourselves when when we get poll poll called on us okay so how would we um use this stuff so yeah okay right so let's go back first so this wake thing we're gonna skim over it because it's kind of um it's kind of outside of the scope of our um uh, the person writing async code so as far as we care it's just like it's the runtime so something like tokyo or whatever saying to us here's a way of waking me up um, you just use that if you need to. Now, by the way, uh, most of the um, features that we write, even if we're implementing poll, we won't actually be doing this kind of stuff. Only the kind of core code will actually use that waker and um, and set set up something in the operating system, right? Most async code is actually calling other async code, and it's somewhere deep down that this kind of stuff gets done. So most of the time, this waker or the context, as we'll see it's called later, 
we just pass it through to somewhere else and we don't worry about it too much. But I think it's just important to try and get our heads around that, like I was saying in the previous video, futures are inert. Nothing happens until you call pole. And the way you know to call pole is because something wakes up your runtime. And the reason something wakes up your runtime is because someone at some point set up this waker to say, like when there's activity on the, on the socket or when um, some timer has passed or whatever, wake up the runtime so the runtime can pole us. Okay, so um, by the way, I just want to pause and say, if none of this makes any sense to you at all, um, it, it's supposed to help you understand what's going on when, you, when you're doing async and awake, um, await. But if, um, if it's just completely confusing, skip over and go to the next video where we're actually using async and await um, and uh, come back to this stuff later. This is like it gives you a deeper understanding of what's really going on when you do async await. Um, but you can actually use it without knowing this stuff. You just, you'll hit confusing corners. So giving you this background is supposed to make it easier. If it's making it harder, um, I'm sorry and we'll skip over it. Anyway, let's plow on. Um, so, um, how would we join futures? So by join, I mean, um, make a future which can, which is only finished when both of the, both of two other futures are finished. So like, um, this would be something you quite often want to do. Like, what I want to wait until I've managed to open a file and I've had a response from the network. And then at that point, I can write the response into the file or something like that. So you've got two features. You want to wait until both of them are done. So how would we implement poll in that case? Well, we're going to make this join struct and we're going to implement, um, we're going to implement simple future for this join struct which takes in two other future types. Um, yeah, because both of these features are themselves simple features. So it's a simple future that, that joins two simple features. Its output is unit, because all it's doing is wait until um, these features are finished, not doing anything with them. So it's a simplified example. The poll method looks the same as before, takes in a wake and a self, this time a mutable reference to self. Maybe that was a bug on the previous slide. Um, and it returns a poll just like all the others. And all it does is it says, if A, so we, we, we're holding on to these two futures as options. So initially they're going to both be some, they're going to have these features inside them because we, we haven't shown the constructor, but that's how that's going to work. Um, they're going to be populated with sums, but then over time they're going to become empty. And the reason for that is this. We say if A exists, like if, if there's something in A, then, um, poll it. And if it wasn't ready, don't do anything. If it was ready, remove it. Make change that change that option here to be a none, because we're kind of done with it. And in in what we might want to do is actually take its result and put it somewhere. But we've said that all the results here, all the outputs here are uh, just the unit type. So essentially, set this option to none when 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 A was ready, and then look at B, and if B, we poll B, and if B is ready, then set B to none. And then if they're both none, then we're ready. Otherwise, we're still pending because one of them has not come back as ready yet. So it's just, this is just like a think, thinking through how will this polling work? If you, if you're implementing a poll function, what's it going to look like? And notice that there's basically no magic in the poll function at all, right? It, um, all it does is checks whether we're ready and then returns ready if we're ready. And if not, it returns pending. Um, the magic is in turning a uh, code with async and await into it into something that's structured like this without you having to do the work. So writing these poll functions for um, complicated scenarios where you're halfway through some operation and you don't know whether you're ready or not and you have to kind of re-grab all the state you were in, check everything, and then say, no, I'm still not ready, and kind of save that state back for later gets really difficult. And that's why async and await make this so nice and beautiful. But actually, the actual implementation of a, a simple poll method is perfectly understandable. Okay, so let's try one other um, uh, uh, implementation of poll. Uh, so before we had a thing called join, which basically waited for both futures to be done. Now we've got a thing called and then, which waits for the first future to be done, and then waits for the second future to be done. So it's almost the same thing, but... Um, 
uh, there's an order to it. The first one has to happen before the second one. And actually, the implementation is pretty much the same as the previous one, except second doesn't need to be an option now because um, we we know we need to wait for first before we do anything else. Um, and then the, re the return value... Basically, if first is not ready yet, we return early, saying we're still pending. Um, but if first is ready then we'll end up poll, uh, just calling poll on the second and then the return value from from poll on the second will be our return value. So we'll be ready when the second one is ready. Um, I might have structured that code differently to make it clear that we only do one or the other. But yeah. Well, I guess if the first one is ready, we go immediately on to do the second one. So that's why we're falling through here. Um, anyway. So that's just another example of how implementing poll in some simple case like this is quite simple, and there's no magic happening here. Um, so takeaways from looking at this code, um, you don't have to do any heap allocations. You don't have to do anything that isn't just um, like direct memory on, on the stack. Um, you don't need to do kind of deeply nested callbacks. Poll is just a simple function that just, just runs through from beginning to end. And the, so... Where is the magic? Where the magic is, is in turning your code with async and await in it into stuff that can just be polled in a simple way. Um, the magic is not actually in the poll function itself. So here is what a real future looks like. So it's called future. It has a, an output type like we've seen before. It takes self and it takes a context. So from our point of view, Context is the same thing as wake. It like, but it, at the moment, I think, um, context is actually only a waker, but they, they called it context because they think in future there might be more stuff that goes in there. I think that's right. I'm not sure. Um, it returns a poll just like it did before. And self takes in not just a mutable reference to self, but a pin of a mutable reference to self. And all you need to know about pin for now is it guarantees that um, that, that's a, it's a pointer to yourself. It guarantees that that pointer won't move out from under us. And the reason we need that guarantee is because the, the, that unwrapping of async await code into a poll method gets really hairy. And if, if our pointer to, if, our, if we might move in memory in between calls to poll, um, it becomes impossible to implement. So, um, the Rust community invented this pin thing to guarantee the thing's not going to move basically in order to solve this problem to have like a self-referential type um, which has has a pointer to itself um, which could get really bad if you then get moved in the middle of that because now your pointer to yourself is not a pointer to yourself anyway so most of the time with pin you can just ignore it and say um, yeah i know this is not going to move um, because it's in a box or something like that um, yeah so that is it for today. Um, so basically, summary of that. Futures um, are things that can be polled. The poll function itself is quite straightforward. What the runtime does is calls poll repeatedly, but in order to avoid doing that in a tight loop, the runtime gets woken up when something interesting has happened uh, and only calls poll then. But the actual poll, it's really quite simple, and the magic is in transforming your sim very... Um, normal looking code into code that's actually implemented via poll in order to make that work you need weird stuff like pin uh, next time we'll look at some async and await code and like how to actually do it in practice which is probably uh, less mind-bending than this uh, so see you next time